Right. Welcome, everybody, to the 16th virtual international day of the midwife on the 5th of May 2024 on the theme Sustainable Midwifery Caring for Tomorrow's World. My name is Portia and I'm facilitating from the UK. We would like to acknowledge our sponsors, Frontier Nursing University USA and Association of Radical Midwives. Next slide. The IDM supports peace across the world for all midwives and the women and families they care for. Next slide, please. For housekeeping, for a start, did you set up your audio when, when you logged in? You may already be on Zoom mute, but to help save bandwidth, we ask you to mute your sound and video until question time. The bottom left side should look like this. There's a, an icon for, for the mic and an icon for the video when you hover. Then we how to give Zoom feedback. At the bottom, you click on reactions, you choose your visible options, which are clap hand, thumbs up, laugh and heart. If they are not visible, you can also, if you need more than the visible, you click on those three dots and then you expand all to all emojis. Then to raise your hand, either click on the raise hand icon at the bottom or click on the three dots labeled more and select the raise hand on the reactions. Next. Then feel free to ask questions or make comments in the public chat panel. Click on the chat icon to open. If this is not present on the panel, click on the three dots labeled as shown, more and select chat. Please keep comments relevant so as to not to distract the speaker. We can also hide this panel. Click on the X icon at the top of the meeting chat. If you wish to talk to another participant, you click at the box that says everyone and select the person. You select on, on the person that you want to private message. So this one for everyone is with a public chat. Then selfie request, please send us your a picture of yourself at this year's conference for our closing slideshow, including your name and where you are, city or state or country, for example, Luna, United Kingdom, then email them to info at vitm.org. Please note that these sessions are recorded and published on YouTube with the public chat, polls, and user panel removed. <clears throat> so now for the for the poll, let's get to know each other. We we'll need to to tell us who you are. You can select your roles as many as possible, like clinical midwife or researcher, educator, whatever applies to you. Then you scroll down to the next question to tell us to tell us whom you are watching with, whom you are attending with, whether alone or three to five other people, six to ten people. Twelve participants. Now we have twenty-four. Okay. Okay, hundred. Since almost everyone is attending alone, so I'll just end the poll and share the results. So we have fifty percent of attendance are clinical midwives, midwife, midwifery educator, seventeen percent, and. 17% media free researcher. Then the next next one you have to 
still in on the chart which country you, you just state the town and the country where you are attending from we have uk vancouver british columbia canada uk Hawira, new zealand northeast england okay midwife texts and cake cakes keep them coming Seems we have Australia, New Zealand, we have Ohio, US. Excellent. It's good that we are reaching out to, stretching out to the continents. Right. Uh, the speaker is Tracy Donagan. Is going, Donagan is going to present on light therapy for midwives. <laughs> so Tracy is a registered midwife, author, and a fervent advocate for women's health, known for her innovative contributions to the field. She's the author of several influential books on mindfulness, positive birth, and underscoring her commitment to empowering women with evidence-based holistic care. Tracy is also the creative force behind two acclaimed apps, Gently Birth and Fatal Mind, and the Mindful Breastfeeding Program, all designed to enhance the well-being and experiences of women during pregnancy, childbirth, and beyond. Her work spanning education and advocacy reflects a deep dedication to advancing maternal and infant health and improving maternity care systems worldwide. Tracy has a special interest in the growing field of photobiomodulation in maternity care. Tracy currently resides in Texas with her two sons and husband, Philip. Interesting. So over to you, Tracy. Okay, to... Thank you, Portia. Thanks to everybody who has made, I guess, this last 24 hours such a success. Uh, for all of your dedication. So um, yeah, I want to talk to you today a little bit about light therapy for midwives. And it's an area that really kind of piqued my interest about a year ago. And when I started learning about it, it struck me as one of these snake oil um, does everything kind of therapies. And as I'm sure we, we've all learned over the years that when you come across a therapy that says it can do everything that we really shouldn't trust it so i've just kind of you know been proven wrong time and time again every time uh, i i do think this is is this a panacea and can it do so much it's not that it does so many things it does one thing really well and that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today about uh, our cellular metabolism, I'm going to take you back to your um, biochemistry classes. Hopefully that won't be traumatic for, for any of you. It was for me when I was learning about this first. So uh, Portia, we can go to the, uh, the first slide, please. So quickly, we're going to look at understanding what photobiomodulation or PBM is. Some of the early discoveries that, that led us to today's like massive amount of research uh, in this area. The evolution of PBM in medicine and where I want to see it go in midwifery, how it works at a cellular level, the safety of PBM in pregnancy, using it as analgesics um, in labor and postpartum and for recovery, and then looking ahead, what is, uh, what's kind of coming up in the research and ways we can apply uh, PBM to other parts of, of women's health. Uh, next slide, Portia. So just for a moment, I want you to just think back to, imagine the response if you were a midwife, maybe, I don't know, 50 or 60 years ago, and the idea of water birth was emerging, and how foreign a concept it seemed, and, and the idea of, like, why would we put women in warm water for labor and, and the fears around that, that, that babies would drown and, and labor would be so much longer. Um, so kind of think back to how you might have responded if you were around in those days when water birth was just kind of becoming recognized or um, 
back in the 1950s when nurse Ward um, in the UK discovered that she would take babies with jaundice outside and like many of us did the belief in you know fresh air and a bit of sunshine does does, does do the world of good and she would take those babies out into the sunshine and you no know, without you know not with hospital approval and then bringing them back in and, and the doctor saying oh there were parts of the baby's body that were still looking a little jaundice and those were the areas where the sun hadn't uh, had, had contact with the skin so now we're at a point where blue light for for uh, jaundice is like something we don't have to think about um, same with TENS machines when TENS machines came out years ago I, the idea and actually still today I think for some uh, for some moms the idea of putting like an electrical stimulus on your back and and how that could uh, make labor easier is uh, still a step too far for some moms but we know there is some uh, some good science behind it so as I continue on um, this afternoon here in Texas I'd like you to suspend your skepticism really suspend your disbelief of what we're going to discuss um, and just think of where this can go in in the next couple of years to support um, women and babies um, and I, I think of it now as like it, you know as, as midwives we, we're always talking about you know if you have a bruise or a bump or a cut you know put a little breast milk on it and, and breast milk kind of cures everything well I feel the same way about uh, photobiomodulation and, and and how applying it to this light form to the body can really have significant and really profound effects on our health uh, next slide Portia so photobiomodulation, it's known under a couple of different names. So photo, meaning light. So these are packets of lights that are being absorbed into uh, specific chromophores or cells that accept um, these light packets. So photo, meaning light, bio, the living cells, and modulation being the influence. So we, we are changing what's happening in these cells. And one of the reasons why it's so difficult to track down the research, um, specifically on pregnancy and the use of PBM, is it's also been known as um, cold laser, uh, red light therapy, uh, LLLT. So when you're searching the research, you have to use there's more keywords than the photobiomodulation that you'll need to use. Um, but the scientists agreed, I think it was about 2018, that photobiomodulation was going to be the scientific term that was agreed upon that would be used in uh, future research. Uh, next slide. So photobiomodulation, it's a form of light therapy that uses non-harmful, so we're not using UV rays, non-thermal, so this, is, this does not heat up the skin the way a heat lamp would, of light through the eyes, which through the eyes were going directly into uh, uh, parts of the brain and then to the skin to activate healthy physiologic responses from the cells in the body to increase cellular energy. And that's really the key here. We're helping our cells, specifically our mitochondria in our cells to work more efficiently and to, to get them back into a state of homeostasis um, reduce, to reduce pain and inflammation. So the process itself, involves these specific light sensitive chromophores or light acceptors that we have uh, in the mitochondria that elicit this physiologic response from the cells when they're activated by specific wavelengths and these are wavelengths that are found in the sunlight when we're uh, when we're outside uh, next slide so if we think of light as an essential nutrient and unfortunately, most of us are in fact light deficient and our bodies are starved for light. Um, we are, we, we spend, I think it's estimated around 95% of our time indoors. So not only are we missing out on, and we know that there, you know, already we have, there are concerns around uh, vitamin D levels in pregnancy and most of us being deficient. Um, but when we look at spending 95% of our time indoors, we're indoors under artificial lives. So there is, an, and there is a wealth of evidence showing um, how artificial light can be harmful to, uh, to all of us when we are not getting any of that direct sunlight. So artificial light does come with risks that we are well aware of. 
And next slide, Portia. So just a little about the, the beginning of, of where it all started. So um, back in these, I think it was the 1960s, uh, Professor Mester was, uh, he was, let's say, playing around. He was playing around with a what, what's known as the Ruby laser and wanted to see if by implanting cancer cells into rats, could they either, could he either make the cancer grow by applying this laser to it, or could they destroy the cancer cells? So he didn't actually, it didn't, his theories didn't prove out at all. But what he noticed was on the areas that the laser was used, the wounds healed much faster and the hair grew back significantly faster in those areas. So when he, re he then realized that the laser he was using was actually not as powerful as the original Ruby laser. So this was where it started, this low level laser therapy. And then we move on to, you know, years later, then we see NASA doing uh, experiments in space, uh, looking at wound healing and the idea, you know, what does, what, how does um, being in a, in a uh, an anti -gra non -gravi gravity, uh, how does that affect wound healing and, and bone density? So uh, NASA came out with these studies, and but they weren't using lasers. NASA were using LEDs. And these are similar to the LEDs that we see, you know, we, we have, have in our homes. So something that is, again, not dangerous. And uh, when we're using a specific wavelength, we can really change what our body is doing and the cells within that. Um, so these days, uh, Professor Michael Hamblin, who's uh, based in the UK, is the authority on PBM and has been cited in, I think, I think the citations are something like between 40 and 60,000 times. And a lot of his work these days is on using PBM for uh, traumatic brain injury and Alzheimer's and uh, Parkinson's disease. So it's, it's really an exciting time uh, to, be, to be alive when this uh, therapy that has been around for quite a while is really now starting to make it to mainstream. So uh, next slide. So the current use of PBM, uh, this is what we're seeing now. So we are already very familiar with blue light for jaundice, uh, acute and chronic pain. So we're seeing it used now by dentists and uh, pediatrics. So specifically for, they can use these, these lasers for as analgesics. So for any of you who have kids that you know are, are really scared of the dentist, we can use this laser and, uh, and, then, and, and get good analgesia for, uh, for that procedure. We have accelerated wound healing and improved scar remodeling. Uh, good research on fibromyalgia, burns, bone fractures, stroke, as I mentioned, um, traumatic brain injury, uh, age-related macular degeneration, arthritis, and then skin care. So you might have seen some of these pop up on your, uh, if you're on Amazon, because there's uh, so much focus on red light for skin care to, so as an anti-aging anti uh, product. So this is kind of where, where the research has, ha it's kind of diverged off. We have, we have the clinical research, which is focused on using um, the, the uh, treatments for, again, clinical care. And then we have this kind of offshoot, which is more around kind of the bro science for uh, using it for uh, exercise recovery and, and muscle building and, and kind of, you know, weight loss, which is all very well and great. But for, for me, I'm just really interested in how we can apply this uh, therapy for, for mothers today, especially uh, during pregnancy. Go ahead, uh, Portia. So when we look at this, this is kind of what I mentioned earlier on, like when you see a list of, of the, the medical indications that have been studied already using PBM, you look at it and like from like there's hair loss and then there's like wound healing, uh, periodontis, pleurisy. It just seems to be like, is there anything that it can't help? Um, and I haven't found anything yet that it, that it hasn't had an, a positive impact on. Um, so it is, I think, you know, I have to sit down with a group of midwives and let's just come up with a list of what are the big issues that women are faced in pregnancy at the moment? Um, and how can we, you know, start to use these therapies to help them have reduced pain, improved quality of life, 
um, and just and, and increase their, their, their wellness during pregnancy. Uh, go ahead, Portia. So the research is growing. Um, and I want to thank James Carroll from uh, the Novator, who is, he's a researcher and also is, uh, his company produced these, they look, they look like tanning beds for, and there has been like so many trials now that, that we can't in midwifery ignore this anymore. So huge amounts of trials that are ongoing. And if you look in um, the NIH database, you can see like funding for more upcoming trials. And there is uh, several more for uh, pregnancy that's uh, going to be hopefully published soon. Go ahead, Portia. So what does the evidence base look like? So there is strong evidence for musculoskeletal pain, oral mucositis, which I'll talk about in just a moment, and uh, strength and recovery after physical strain and that uh, dry uh, age-related uh, age macular de degeneration. Sorry, my teeth have fallen out here. Um, but I just wanna, before I look at the moderate evidence, uh, for musculoskeletal pain, we all, I'm sure, know somebody who is suffering with moms that we're looking after that have uh, pelvic girdle pain or carpal tunnel syndrome, um, back ache, just all of, you know, some of the, the kind of, you know, complications of pregnancy that can really um, affect a mother's quality of life. So I presented a kind of a longer session at the MAMA conference in Scotland there recently. And just, I'm not associated with MAMA in any way, but I think as midwives, if you can get to the MAMA conference in Scotland next year, it is really a phenomenal community of, of midwives getting together and sharing information and uh, lots of oxytocin. So, but um, I'm sure like, like many of you, there were midwives sitting in, in the audience listening to me speak and with a skeptical eye of how can it do all of these things and uh, there was one midwife in particular that emailed me a couple of days after the conference to say that when I was again how skeptical she was and she her um, daughter was experiencing severe uh, PGP and was on heavy medication codeine uh, opioids and was on crutches and really did debilitated for, for her the, the last couple of weeks of her pregnancy. So the midwife went online, you know, just bought, randomly bought a, uh, a one of these light belts that uh, you can pick up on Amazon and decided to give it a shot. So within literally three days, her daughter has seen a significant improvement in pain management. So she's been able to reduce her, uh, her NSAIDs she has be her movement is better. She is, you know, it's finding it easier to get up the stairs. So for me, when I hear these stories, it's like we have to be talking about this. We have to be talking to every midwife out there about how we can apply this therapy to um, pregnancy and, and postpartum uh, recovery. So then moderate evidence, lymphedema, wound healing. There's some really nice papers out there looking at cesarean wound healing, specifically for uh, again, for analgesic and for healing the actual wound itself more quickly. Then neuropathic pain, fibromyalgia, orthodontics, cognition, and then we're into the experimental uh, trials that we're seeing now. So um, go ahead, uh, Portia. So very recently, the NHS in the UK has adopted PBM for oral mucositis. So for anyone who is unfamiliar with um, what mucositis is, um, for they have br brought it in now as a treatment before they start uh, cancer treatment and during cancer treatments. So for someone who is experiencing oral mucositis, what happens is they end up with really painful mouth ulcers. So in the mouth and uh, in their throat, which means when you are, you know, going about to go through cancer therapy or you are in the midst of cancer therapy, your desire to eat is really, really blunted because who wants to eat when it's so painful? So what they are doing now, and, and if you if you go and Google uh, a photobiomodulation and oral mucositis, you're going to see these. There's some brilliant videos of like like four year olds sitting with this, what looks like a lollipop, big lollipop and kind of, you know, put it into their mouth. So they are able to self treat in the hospital and then they, they put it on their outside, on their cheeks as well. And they're finding like significant improvement 
in uh, in this uh, oral mucositis. So again, quality of life for for these uh, for these people that are dealing with um, like a really serious illness and the complications that come along with that cancer treatment. Uh, go ahead. So if we think of mitochondria, and again, this is the bit that might be a little triggery for some, uh, as it was for me, trying to get back into the biochemistry. So we, if you might remember mitochondria being, you know, the power plants, so the little batteries of every cell in the body. So as long as our mitochondria is working really well, it takes the food, it turn, turns it into energy known as ATP, so that it can, you know, our cells work well, so our bodies work better, and we reduce inflammation. But when our, through aging and injury um, and stress, what happens is our, the, the mitochondria themselves become stressed. And when they become stressed, they release free radicals. And free radicals then are one of the core aspects of inflammation in the body. So more free radicals means more cellular damage and more cell death. So what we're trying to do with this, you know, literally shining this light onto the skin is to energize those mitochondria so they can do their job uh, more effectively. Um, next slide. So we're talking about this. I, I like this term, a cascade of light, because we're all we're all very familiar with the cascade of intervention. But this is a really positive cascade. So these light receptors, again, th these chromophores uh, uh, in our cells that cause the ATP to increase. So cells have more energy then to, for all of the functions of the body. The oxygen then it, it displaces nitric oxide. And if any of you remember Krebs cycle, learning about this uh, cycle in, of cell metabolism, it's uh, quite an intricate and detailed, uh, I guess, um, description of, of how it works. I'm not going to go into today. I, it's, uh, it's, it's because we don't really need to know it right now. Uh, and that, that displacement causes an overproduction of harmful uh, reactive oxygen species, those free radicals, and it causes DNA damage. So when we have healthy levels of nitric oxide, that increases vasodilation and accelerates the inflammation process. So accelerating, not interrupting it and decreasing pain. So then we have uh, wound healing time then being significantly accelerated. And this is, I mean, this is the leading hypothesis. I think researchers are still trying to figure out now, what is this actually what's happening? But we seem to have narrowed it down to these mitochondria. And, and mitochondria are present in like, you know, hundreds and thousands in, in every cell in the body. And for areas that like the brain, um, reproductive like the the ovum um, would have something between 200,000 to 600,000 so anywhere that we need a lot of cellular energy and um, heart tissue you will see that um, they have there's a, a lot more mitochondria in those uh, in those tissues uh, go ahead so when the mitochondria is dysfunctional, we have trouble, basically. And it turns on this master switch for, for more inflammation in the body. And that's known as um, NFKB, nuclear factor kappa B. Um, inflammation increases cell death, aging, degenerative diseases. So think of red light therapy or PBM as uh, regenerative medicine, because we are seeing it improves, not just improves wound healing, but it is causing an angiogenesis, um, uh, DNA changes. So if we can help those ATP and get those that get more energy into the mitochondria, that master switch then turns like it's like a double edged sword, it turns on for repair and regeneration by reducing inflammation, increases circulation around the body, then reducing pain and increases stem cells. Um, for different areas of the body. Uh, go ahead, next one. So there are other ways that we can stimulate this ATP within the cells. So for anyone who is a fan of intermittent fasting, we know that supports mitochondrial functioning. Um, high intensity exercise does the same thing. And of course, sunlight. But these all usually, with, especially with exercise and fasting, they all take time to have an impact on our mitochondria. Whereas we know that with PBM, sometimes the, the effect can be almost immediate. 
as I, you know, shared with you that example from uh, the midwife's daughter in uh, in the UK, having that experience within three days, able to significantly reduce her uh, her her, you know, significant reduction in uh, pain management and medication. So the analgesic effects can be immediate. Uh, personally, I have found with working it with uh, myself is. Again, it depends on the tool you're using, um, you know, 15 to 20 minutes. If I've, you know, you know turned an ankle out running today, I can sit with my, my literally a light pad that wraps around my foot and 20 minutes, I'll do it kind of a couple of times a day. And um, I feel pretty good um, pretty quickly. Um, go ahead, Portia. So we know that pregnancy uh, and, and participating in, in endurance effect require a significant uh, metabolic increase. And, and in pregnancy, we have, we have huge adaptations taking part. And we know that, that most women are not entering into pregnancy in a really healthy, well state. So applying light to the women who are dealing with, again, a lot of the muscular skeletal problems and somewhere that, something that I have a, a really strong interest in is using this for metabolic disorders such as uh, preeclampsia. I think there is huge potential for us to um, to maybe prevent uh, preeclampsia right from the beginning of pregnancy. Um, go ahead, next slide. So when we talk about this, is quite an interesting aspect of this therapy. So. When, if you go out and you look at some of the main uh, manufacturers of PBM products, uh, pretty much everything says, not, do not use in pregnancy, do not use in pregnancy. Or, you know, I've had discussions with, uh, with other researchers saying, oh, there isn't any research. But as I mentioned earlier, you have to really dig in to find that research. And there actually is uh, plenty of studies out there that uh, have shown no um, side effects. So if we're comparing, you know, a woman that is, you know, third trimester dealing with pelvic girdle pain, which is you know, so common. And she is now taking um, uh, ibuprofen or other NSAIDs. You know, we know that that has a risk, that, that, that there's risks associated with that on, on mom's uh, system and on her babies. So we can see here just a couple of the examples of um, evidence for using it safely and a couple of systematic reviews that are saying, yeah, this is actually not, a, uh, not, not dangerous for women at all. Uh, next slide. So there have not been any trials on using PBM on the bump itself. So women who have participated in, in trials previously, the, it's usually the belt is used, especially for labor and back pain, then we're using the belt on the lower back not on the bump. Um, but I want to tell you about a really interesting research um, that was done um, a couple of years ago, an Australian piece of research. And it was trying to, they, they had looked at using PBM to reduce uh, retinopathy of prematurity in animal studies, and it seemed to work really well. So they, they ran, did a trial, and then this was the, the larger trial that they did using uh, light therapy. And usually like the baby is in the, in the um, uh, like in, in their isolate and they have the light therapy just really over their head. So they're getting kind of almost like a full body experience of the red light. So what they found was, and these babies were um, like 27 weeks. So these babies were very ill babies and they did the therapy um, daily until they were, I think it was 34 weeks. They didn't, based on the protocol that they used, they didn't find that uh, it improved this, but there were no adverse reactions. However, and again, it didn't reach statistical significance, all of the babies in the PBM group survived. So um, we have, and I think, you know, if I was a mom, I would be thinking if I had a premature baby, knowing this research, I would be asking for it because like that's five babies that, uh, that were lost. And, and again, we, we need more research in this area, but it's definitely something that, uh, again, we might be able to help the, you know, the, the most vulnerable in our, in, our, uh, in our care, those premature babies. Um, next. 
So I think one of the questions we need to be asking when, when I do get this question about oh, the risk of red light. So again, this is red light and near infrared that we are exposed to when we're sitting out in the sunlight. When we don't have you know, 10 inches of a uh, of sunscreen on us and, and all of our clothes on as well. So there are, again, plenty of research out there showing the impact, significant impact on health of shift work. And, and, you know, as midwives, I think we are particularly at risk for, you know, again, not being, you know, where are we, we have abused our circadian rhythm, really. And, and uh, we're now only seeing what's coming out in the research of how this affects our health, our hormone, our hormones, there's every aspect of our mind and body that is affected when we are out of sync with our circadian rhythm and our exposure to light. So there's been some interesting studies, higher blue light exposure in pregnancy is associated with fast, higher fasting glucose and infant birth weight. So women who are sitting on their phones at nighttime, you know, over a couple of hours watching TV or sitting in front of an iPad, we really need to discourage that. And, you know, as some of you are, are you know, very aware of, of how melatonin and uh, oxytocin work so well together. Another study then pre-sleep light exposure linked to gestational diabetes. And then another, this last trial was in China and it was association between exposure to outdoor artificial light. So just street lighting in early pregnancy at night and the risk of preterm birth. So I really feel like we have not even scratched the surface of, uh, of the, the risks of artificial light in pregnancy. Um, and I remember talking to Michelle O'Don years ago about this idea of using blue light as a way to slow or prevent preterm labor. And there's been some really interesting experiments done with, with women who are in prodromal labor where it was at nighttime. So we have high melatonin levels, um, oxytocin is, is building and they would wake the women up and put on a uh, CTG and watch the labor pattern and they could see that how their the, the the pattern of surges got the, longer so we had we had definitely an impact on um on on labor patterns as well and we all know we, we talk to women about oh you know sometimes when you go into hospital that you know because of the stress and the moving moving from home to hospital it can slow your labor I'm thinking, yes, yeah, stress is one part of it, but we really need to have these moms walking in, not wearing sunglasses, but wearing blue blockers to prevent the uh, fluorescent light from affecting their labor. Um, go ahead, Portia. So some of the contraindications that we've kind of seen so far. So again, not to be used over the abdomen in pregnancy or during the first trimester. However, um, what they're seeing in animal studies, and I know that we can't always extrapolate animal studies into uh, human trials, but what we're seeing in the animal studies is that it is supportive and have positive impact on uh, early uh, development. Um, we always want moms to talk to their providers about using PBM, and that's really to do with the increased circulation and cellular health may change your dosage requirements. So talking to, again, the more midwives know and the more we can share with uh, with our obstetric colleagues as well, it's really, really important. And then being careful with photosensitive medications, um, light sensitive antibiotics, and we don't wanna use it on wet skin, really because it's uh, we, we it will reflect off the skin. Um, but we do not see any issues with LEDs and burns or um, discomfort at all, uh, no, side effects registered really in, in, in the studies on pregnancy. Go ahead, Portia. So as an analgesic, what is the mechan mechanism of action? So first of all, it increases blood circulation. So we are bringing in all of these great endorphins. We're bringing lots of good blood flow to the area, especially in those early stages of like maybe after a uh, cesarean birth. The inflammation process is accelerated and completed. So NSAIDs interrupt the inflammation process, whereas PBM will accelerate it to completion. Stimulates cellular repair, we have endorphin release, and then it, it act, almost acts as a block um, for those signals that are traveling to the brain. Um, next slide. So there's been a couple of labor pain studies and um, 
One of the, the first one was a trial that was done in Iran, and it was on first time moms and comparing it to a hot water, ba- hot water bottle. And what they found was um, significantly reduced pain perception and uh, shorter labors as well. So which I think we can make sense if we have increased circulation um, and analgesic response. We have moms that can be up and mobile and, and moving. Um, And the second study then was a study from Brazil, and that was comparing it to using uh, PBM for, and and these are, we're only using it for like 20 minutes. And that was 20 minutes, I think twice uh, during the labor. Um, This randomized control trial did include uh, multips as well. So not not a great trial, but still really interesting to to read about the experiences using, um, again, these, these very simple tools on, on the lower back during labor. And then there has been multiple papers on pain reduction for painful periods. Um, there is some, there's some nice studies on um, endometriosis as well. So, uh, so for, again, abdominal pain, musculoskeletal pain, and we know that as, as women, abdominal pain just isn't rare, is rarely taken seriously. So here's a tool that women can use for themselves um, if they haven't found um, satisfactory care with their, with their provider. Go ahead. So some of the applications for postpartum recovery, reduction in analgesic requests after cesarean birth. And these are, this is published research, um, accelerated wound healing after cesarean, perineal injury uh, for nipple pain. Um, we haven't looked at breastfeeding after pains yet, but I, I would put money on it that it will work really, really well. Uh, lower back pain, vaginal dryness. So this uh, could be you know, connected with breastfeeding, but also I think there, there may be, um, anyone watching here today who's menopausal may find uh, the red light therapy to be really helpful for you as well. Uh, postpartum depletion. So, we, so when you're a mom in who's kind of, you know, when you're a new mom, you're in a state of acute inflammation. So anything that we can do to give ourselves a boost for, you know, more energy ourselves for more and less brain fog, I think has to be a good thing for postpartum for, uh, for these moms. A um, couple of studies on mental health and then the mastitis study it hasn't been, um, it has been done on, I think in dairy farms, which will tell you how important um, breastfeeding is to the world, uh, but we haven't seen any uh, mastitis yet. So maybe there's somebody watching today that would like to uh, take up that challenge and let's have a look at some new research on um, mastitis. Uh, go ahead, Portia. So this is an area that I think there is huge potential. And I'm, again, hoping that somebody will watch this and realize that, yes, there is definitely something we can do here. So preeclampsia being, again, one of the few fatal complications of pregnancy in the developed world. There is no cure, really, and it often requires labor induction, which, of course, there's, there's you know, risks there as well. So it is largely being associated with free radicals produced by the placenta. And oxidative stress seems to be the central component of both the placental and endothelial function. So I, for me, I think this is somewhere that I would love to see somebody um, jump on this bandwagon and, and let's do some studies. And because the, the, this could be really life changing, life saving uh, research. Go ahead, Portia. So in summary, this is really one of the most exciting um, aspects of and the fastest growing aspects of medicine today. It has been underutilized in pregnancy so far. I think there is uh, we can really do a lot of good um, by learning more about using PBM within our own ther- within our own services um, for anyone who is involved in kind of you know the biohacking community. What you'll find is they're already using red light therapy in pregnancy. They have been using it for, for you know, a couple of years now, um, but we're just learning about it now. So moms are already off using it. So it's really important that we can uh, answer their questions and help them use it really in an optimal way. So I hope that was, that was kind of a, a whistle stop tour of PBM. Hope that was interesting and hopefully you'll uh, go use it.